Okay, was Phil with us? Okay, yeah. Was Phil with us earlier, Emma? Yes, he was. So um, I think he might have had a bit of a technical issue. And okay. uh, so Sky's going to try and get hold of him and uh, he'll follow on from me. Absolutely fine. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be doing a, a short talk today, really, just about Rural Action Derbyshire and um, and how we're working with halls and how we want to look at moving forwards with village halls to support you all to the best of our ability going forward. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, slide show. So, um, so Rural Action Derbyshire, you obviously all know about us because you're here at our, our conference. Um, but something you might not know is that we've actually been working with Village and Community Hall since 1924, which was when we started as a community council. And you can see there uh, in that little excerpt that that is from the first annual report in 1925, where it highlights village halls. So it's something that we've been doing a long time and feel that we're uh, quite experienced now working with the various halls. And that we believe very strongly that um, that halls and the volunteers, um, thousands of volunteers throughout Derbyshire who manage them, uh, offer a really important service to the community. And I think we'll see over the you know today and the next two days what a diverse range of um, subject matter that you really need to to be um, up to date on in order to to run your hall effectively. So. We run an advisory and support service um, and we, as I said, really appreciate what local halls and community buildings do because it's not just about village halls, it's a range of community buildings from scout huts to um, even sports facilities, anywhere that shares their, their building with the wider community uh, over and above just the specific activity that it might have been um, developed for initially. And we offer a variety of specialist services and looking after village halls, um, you'll know it's, it is quite specialist. You have to consider so many different um, elements from whether you have an alcohol license and playing music and accessibility and health and safety and data protection. The list goes on and on and on of all the different areas that you need to really be um, quite expert at. So we can provide a lot of that information and advice for you. COVID has had a, a very significant impact on everybody. Um, it was unprecedented. Everything was unprecedented, really, um, because it was also new. There was so much uncertainty, um, personal uncertainty, business uncertainty, and certainly from the point of view of running community buildings. Um, there's the income streams, if you had to close, which halls did, but also even for our own business, um, for our own organisation, you know, how do you manage the staff? We've got homeschooling, we've got furlough, all of the things that impacted us, impacted you and the wider area. And it changed everything very, very quickly. So halls were forced to close, the income stopped immediately. Government regulations were very complex, constantly being updated. And it was also, there was very little specifically about community buildings that was easy to find. It was very, very extensive, the government guidelines. And um, so it was, it was hard to really get your head around and understand how it impacted on all of the halls. And funding, um, that wasn't always clear as to who could and couldn't apply for funding. Do you pay rates? Um, there were lots of different criteria because most of the funding was run by the local authorities. So it varied slightly from local authority area to local authority area. Um, and also there was all the worry about actually catching COVID um, or family catching COVID. So there was an awful lot to be worried about. Um, so huge concerns for personal health, for that of one's family and friends, but also what's going on in the wider community in your own area. Halls are really the centre of a community 
and what could what could the halls do to help the wider community um, there were some conditions if you were providing certain uh, educational settings or food provision emergency food provision and other things but generally it it was hard to understand what you could and couldn't do and um, the worry of what would happen to the hall in the future if the income stopped and how long was that income not going to be available for the government advice as I said changed regularly so what we did at Rural Action Derbyshire was um, we provided as much information as we could on our website so here's a, an um, a, an illustration of just a small part of our page just showing what was changing we tried to update the website as much as we could and um, sent out regular emails and provided templates and documents that halls could adapt and use themselves so acre was the the organization that was most critical in going through the government regulations and working out what it was specifically that applied to community buildings and then put that into a format that was easy for you to understand how you needed to move forwards and then giving you the templates to adapt for your hall. Um, we gave a lot of one-to-one -one advice via email. Obviously we had to make the transition to working from home at the same time as everybody else. And um, and it was it was email was really the best way that we could keep in touch with people. We ran regular online training sessions and coffee mornings, and we were fortunate to get some funding from Foundation Derbyshire to help us to continue to do this all still free of charge. Um, so this is Tansley Village Hall. This is um, after they were able to reopen. So you can see the social distancing, the wearing of masks, the using of um, hand gels going into the hall and um, the, the social distancing um, that people had to, to follow. Um, it was, Tansley was one of the first to, um, to get up running and get uh, activities going back in the halls again. And um, again, here's just a clip from our website, just showing um, that we were updating the information regularly. And here's um, some of the resources that were available through our website, a lot of which you can just see the Acre um, logo on there came directly through from Acre. And we had some wonderful feedback. I couldn't possibly include all of it, but I thought this one summed it up quite well that uh, the, how grateful the trustees were for the updates and the information and how valuable it was and how much more difficult it would have been um, if they had to um, try and disseminate the government guidelines, as they say, which probably will have finished us off. So um, there's a lot of opportunity going forwards for halls, and I think this conference highlights some of the interesting opportunities that are out there. Um, and we will continue to be there to offer dedicated specific information and advice to, go to village halls and community buildings. Um, but there is now um, a need to, um, to put a membership package in place to enable us to offer, to continue to offer this service to the best that we possibly can, to have a dedicated membership. So this will be open to all Derbyshire village halls and community buildings. It will give you access to all of the updates, leg legislation, uh, training, funding, et cetera. And um, also one-to-one -one consultancy appointments for some specific problems um, that you may have or specific areas of work that you would like to look at getting covered. We want it to be affordable, and we do think that it's going to be very good value. So the offer is that you will have full access to regular members only newsletters. So this will give you all of the information that you need and signpost you probably to our website or other digital resources, which again will be members only. So we will give um, non-members still the opportunity to receive some emails which will highlight perhaps some of the areas that they need to look into um, but as a member you would have access to all of the information with some tips on how best to apply any 
uh, changes required to your hall. Uh, you'll get some discounts on the, the wide range of acre information sheets and um, the model hiring agreement and discounts on tickets for training and events that we do, as well as discounts for the consultancy. We're going to be developing some additional services, which will be part of the membership. We are going to be introducing corporate partnerships and a business and trade directory. So corporate partnerships will be um, with professional bodies, solicitors, accountants, architects, etc. people that will be um, offer services that halls may need and um, part of the package would be some sort of um, some sort of discount or additional service at a reduced rate that will be available to members of the halls. And then we're going to create a business and member directory. So it's, um, it's not always easy to find suppliers or contractors to carry out work. It's, it's easy to make contact with them and they say, yes, we'll turn up and do a quote. And it, it's, it's a bit like herding cats, I think, sometimes trying to get suppliers. Uh, so we'll be developing a directory of, of various trades and businesses that you might want to call upon for, for various jobs from um, just putting in some lights, you know, small jobs up to, to a much bigger refit. So it'll cover everything from electrical work, plumbing, heating, kitchens, floors, landscaping, car parks and, and all sorts. So our priority is to make it affordable, is to keep it simple. We did look at having different tiers of membership for uh, the different size of hall, but we wanted to keep it simple and to offer some other payment options as well. So if you join before the um, 1st of April, the cost is £50 plus VAT, which works out at a very affordable £1.15 pence per week. So I think for the amount of um, dedicated and very specific advice that you're getting for halls, I think you'd agree that £1.15 a week is, is excellent value for money. Going forwards from the 1st of April, membership will be £75 plus VAT, which still works out at a remarkable £1.73 a week. So still excellent value. And um, for setting up with payments by direct debit and things like that, we will be able to also uh, offer a little bit of a discount on that. So thank you to everybody that's involved with running village halls and community buildings. Um, we hope that you value and appreciate the advice that we are able to give you that is specific to running halls. And we do look forward to working with you again in the future. So um, I think that I don't have access to a clock, but I think that um, Phil is here now, so I'll sign off and uh, and hand over to Phil. Yeah, thank you, Emma. <laughs> okay, we can take some questions on that perhaps a little bit later. Yeah, we might have time at the end. So thank you for filling in uh, at short notice there. Uh, apologies to everybody. Uh, the wonders of delivering an online conference, these things happen. And apologies to Phil if you were there ready waiting. Um, you're here now, that's the main thing. So that's absolutely fantastic. So rather than uh, spend more time, I will pass straight over to Phil and again, questions in the chat box. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Great, thanks very much, Helena. And, and hello everyone from uh, Cumbria here. I would say a sunny Cumbria, but it's a bit drizzly. Um, I, I just want to say thank you for Emma for standing in there. I had been waiting patiently, but um, technology as it is, um I was removed just at the last minute but what I would like to do is really follow on from what Michael and Peter were talking about this morning in terms of energy and sustainability and actually the wider community because one of the really salient things that Peter mentioned was that your village halls and community buildings do not operate in isolation clearly you've got lots of visitors you've got your communities that come to those centers, to those hubs. And so you are a hub for inspiration, you are a hub for information. Uh, and I think you're also a hub in terms of the, the, the moral stance that you take in this current climate crisis. So um, Helena, if you could start the slides, that would be much appreciated. Wonderful. Um, 
so I'm from Cumbria Action for Sustainability, or CAFS, as we call ourselves up here in Cumbria. Uh, my name's Phil Davis, and uh, I've got my contact details there at the bottom. Um, I was going to look at the potential responses to the climate crisis, but um, if you could move on to the next slide, please, there. Um, I'm just going to really cover the 20 years of experience that I've had working on a practical level. And when I say practical level, I mean dirty hands as well. Uh, in the village halls here in Cumbria, I've worked with maybe 50 or 60. I've probably been in insulating about 30 of them in the lofts and, and working with them on renewable energy. And more recently on electric vehicle charge points, which is going to be the meat of, um, of, of what I talk about in the second half of this presentation. But um, what I'd like to do is first of all, talk about um, CAFs. Helena, if you could, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I know as a volunteer for a community energy company myself, the hard work that everyone puts into looking after community enterprises and village halls. So you'd rather me move on quickly to the, um, to the practical end of the presentation. We have been around um, almost the same time as the uh, Marches Energy Agency. Um, we've now got 28 staff. Um, we were almost whistling in the wind for 10 years, trying to get people to listen to the issues about climate change. And now everyone is uh, battering down our doors, which is, is wonderful. So we do lots of things from tackling fuel poverty to setting up community energy uh, owned companies. And we're currently leading the Zero Carbon Partnership Programme, which is right across all of the local authorities and third sector as well. Uh, next slide, please. One of the key things that we do is um, outreach and awareness. And we do have a really, really strong um, series of education programs on carbon literacy, um, which you can, uh, any of you or your communities, your, um, can book onto as well. Um, and that goes right through the sort of science that Peter and Michael were alluding to, as well as their solutions. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to talk about some of the practicalities um, and some of the lessons that I've learned uh, from, from trying to support community buildings and village halls for the last 20 years. And one of the first things we've been listening this morning about these energy auditors, uh, of which I am, I am one, but it's quite interesting because quite a lot of village halls, as many of you will know, are, are very old. And some of them have structural issues. And some energy auditors are very good on auditing carbon and auditing energy use and energy loss and energy demand, but they actually might not be wonderful at understanding whether you've got single phase or three phase or two phase electricity and what that might mean on the local grid. Um, and so one of the issues that we had in Cumbria a long time ago, back in 2005, was that whilst it, we thought it was useful getting a, an audit done, an, an energy audit done of the village hall, we then found that the village hall committees were coming back to us and said, do you know a good uh, mechanical and electrical engineer? Do you know a good architect? Do you know a good structural engineer? Because all of these things were needed before some of the remedial work to make them more energy efficient could happen. So I don't know whether it's a template for others, but we set up a Cumbria Energy Auditors Group where we organized to have some expertise across the realms that are required to to do some transformational work on village halls. Now, it's one thing if you're just simply going to put some more loft insulation into your roof, into your attic space. But if you're, for instance, going to put solar panels on your roof, you'll need a structural report. If you're going to build uh, anything onto your building, you'll need an architect. Um, and so we amass these group of specialities and they work and still today work together to provide a 
I, I guess, a one-stop shop. So, um, so our village hall committees have been finding that really useful. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of talk about funding, and I know that so many committees are incredibly creative in terms of writing applications, beating down the door, whether it's the LEP or the lottery or local funds to support your programs of retrofit and to help you make this transition to zero carbon or at least low carbon. Um, notwithstanding the work that you put in, um, there's also the volunteering that can happen when um, your volunteers actually go about doing the insulation or doing the fitting. Obviously, there needs to be um, the caveat of all of the safety precautions and qualifications required. But one of the things that we managed to do here in Cumbria was we teamed up with a local manufacturer of sheep's wool insulation, Thermofleece, Second Nature Thermofleece. And we were able to work with volunteers for the volunteers to actually fit the thermofleece into their community buildings. And we, or the committees, um, used the hourly rate that a fitter would normally charge to put in that insulation to match fund the funds that came from other sources. And I know match funding is, you know, so sometimes is the, you know, the nightmare that wakes you up uh, if, you're a, if you're a committee member. But there are ways of making this transition, of using volunteers, um, of using some of the safe things that you can do in and around a community building to match fund. Um, and I think to date we must have put in about 36 halls with village halls with sheep's wool insulation. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, Peter, I thought your presentation was absolutely wonderful and really comprehensive on, um, on undertaking an energy audit and, and, and the, the things that the committees need to consider, anything, everything from behaviour change to energy demand, to reducing that demand. And, and what you talked about was that hierarchy. One of the things that we found very um, uh, clear here in Cumbria is that some of our buildings, and I imagine yours too down in Derbyshire, are of a very traditional nature. And one of the issues is about making sure that the fabric is fit for now and fit for the future. Because as soon as your fabric starts to deteriorate, whether it's the gutter that I showed you in the first slide, or whether it's um, uh, pointing in walls or chimneys, is that the first thing is to, as, as Peter said, is the reduction of energy loss. And so it's key that your village halls, as I'm sure you know, are kept in as good a condition as you can afford to keep them. But what you've got in front of you here is a picture of um, some Eden Valley sandstone in a, in a Temple Sowerby village hall. This was covered in cement render, which meant that the building couldn't breathe. And the pointing was also, um, where it wasn't rendered, the pointing was done in cement, which meant that when there was moisture in the building, it would come out through the, um, very slowly through the sandstone and the sandstone started to freeze and thaw and deteriorate. So what you can see there is actually a building that has been repointed using traditional methods of line pointing, which is not only um, keeps our heritage and heritage skills and import local employment going, but it is also best for the building. Um, CAFs have been involved in a lot of um, skills training and heritage training with regard to using traditional materials in order to um, reduce the energy demand of buildings and, and to insulate them potentially uh, in, in certain circumstances with hemp and lime insulation and perlite and diathenite. So there's lots of different, if you've got a village hall um, and it needs retrofitting, do consider the fabric first. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, um, 
Peter and, and Michael also mentioned there about renewable energy and, and all of you will be considering what is the best thing and scratching your poor heads because it's not easy. Can I just say um, very strongly that we always talk about the financial payback. Isn't it time that we started talking about other things than financial payback? You are, as I said, beacons and inspirations to the wider community. Um, we know that if someone puts on panels, someone else does. If someone puts in an air source heat pump, someone will come and nosy and ask how it's operating. Absolutely, I, re I respect that village hall committees are often working on very, very meager budgets and therefore renewable energy can be out of, out of your reach. If you can scrimp and scrape to get those on the building, please don't just think about whether it's going to take eight years, 12 years or 18 years. Um, you'll have all been hearing about the phasing out and now the phasing down of coal. Let's try and make that change happen now. And if you can do it, I salute you. Uh, next slide, please. So I've mentioned the word inspiration uh, a number of times because um, your village halls keep communities alive um, for lots of reasons. You give people hope and vitality, things to do during the day, the evening, a place to meet, a place to eat. Um, a place of warmth, a place of safety in emergency conditions. Um, it's a thankless task being a committee member. Um, I appreciate that, but you, what the work that you do uh, is so important. So in terms of climate change and responding to that, um, I think the work that, um, that village halls are doing in terms, of, in terms of lowering their carbon footprint is absolutely uh, important. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to add a little bit of uh, a little bit of technical stuff here. This is what we call scope one, two, and three. You needn't remember this. All the most important thing is this is how uh, carbon emissions are calculated. So the scope one is really sort of the manufacturing or on-site. Uh, energy generation or digging of coal if you're a if you're a coal mining uh, company but it's it's those um, direct uh, emissions from manufacturing and from energy generation but it also includes if you've got company cars it would also include the carbon footprint of those scope two is the energy that you use in your building. So if you're using 5,000 kilowatts of gas or 5,000 units, kilowatt hours of, of electricity, then the carbon footprint of that is measured. But what everyone is finding now is it's the scope three um, emissions that people are particularly worrying about because quite often they're far, far in excess of the scope one and the scope two. So what does scope three mean? Basically, if you were to buy a TV, you would need to take into account the transport of that good, the manufacture of that good, or the mining of the components of that television, and so much more. But I want to really highlight just one issue about potential scope three of a, of a, of a community building or a village hall, if you wished to, to, um, to look further. And that is transport, because often you'll have your local community walk to your village hall, which is wonderful. But Derbyshire's like Cumbria. The village hall doesn't just always sit in the middle of the, the population. It's often on the outskirts of the village, or the village is incredibly dispersed. So we have to travel. And it was interesting that Michael showed a slide of the parish council carbon calculator and of a total of 17.4 tons of annual emissions i noticed that 7.5 tons was associated with transport to and from the building that's 43 percent so the second half of this this presentation is going to be about electric vehicles 
and they're particularly electric vehicle charge points. And a model of hosting electric vehicle charge points that might help in the coming years as everyone changes to electric vehicles of playing your part as an inspiration, but also as a resource for those that either in or in your community already, or are those that are coming to visit your community. So um, next slide, please. So I, you know, Peter my, Peter talked about the, the, the hierarchy of energy use. And, and really we need to consider the hierarchy of, of transport. Obviously, if your community can walk to the village hall, wonderful or cycle or take the public transport we don't really have a lot here and you won't have a lot in derbyshire i doubt and then um, if you can't walk or cycle or take public transport or car share the next best thing is electric vehicles next slide please So I mentioned about 43%, uh, in general, 33% of, of greenhouse gas emissions come from transport. Um, and I'm not going to, to lecture you now on, the, on, on why we need to make that transition. So next slide, please. Uh, and just keep pressing the button if that's possible. <laughs> and just keep, just keep going until the slide is full. Thank you, and a couple more. Lovely, and one more. Okay, and stop there. Thank you. So it probably is quite baffling to many of you what these charge points do and cost. Suffice to say, don't think for one moment that on a on a meagre budget that you're going to be able to put in a super rapid charger that's going to charge up a car in 20 minutes, because that is likely to cost between sort of 50,000 and 100,000 pounds for a charge point. So these super rapid ones that you've heard about on motorways or for Tesla are very, very expensive. Those that are on a domestic building might be about 800 pounds. And those that are called fast chargers that are 20, 22 kilowatt, which charge uh, a Renault Zoe in about two and a half hours would cost around 5,000 to 10,000 pounds to put in one of those charge points. And I'm just giving you these figures and in, as an introduction to the complexities of charging. The cheaper they are, the longer it takes to charge a vehicle, but you might not have something called three phase, which is lots of electricity coming into your hall. So you might be restricted to the first ones, or you might be able to get an up upgrade by your energy um, distribution network operator, um, your energy company, and be able to put in a fast charger, or you might be able to put in a rapid charger, but that is going to cost a lot of money. So the next, so I'm going to try and explain a solution to all of this for you. Next slide, please. We have been working at CAFS with a social, well, it's a community benefit society called Charge My Street. And if you remember nothing else, not my name, not my organization, I want you to go away and visit chargemystreet.co.uk after this, because they are a potential solution for um, your village hall, your community building in terms of electric vehicle charge points. Um, and it's a really, really comprehensive uh, website. Next, um, next slide, please. So effectively, um, Charge My Street's been set up because not everyone has their own driveway. People live in terrace houses. People live in tenements. People don't have their driveway because they live in a flat. So what do those people do for their own charging? Well, they rely on public charge points. Not all are accessible all of the time, although it was really great to hear the leader of Derbyshire County Council talking about the rollout of electric vehicle charge points in your county. But there will be a lot of people that are left behind in this transition unless there are more publicly available charge points. And one of the things that Charge My Street does is it works with community centres, pubs, um, libraries, um, and anywhere that is willing to host a charge point and has car parking availability. 
Um, next slide, please. So how does it how does it work? Well, Charge My Street's based up in the north of England. It's actually based in Lancaster. And the principle is, is that the community building, the village hall, the library, the pub hosts the charge point and then Charge My Street buys the electricity from your village hall for the price that you pay for it. And then they sell it to the person charging their car for a small profit. And that profit helps to pay for the administration and the management and the installation of the charge point. So one of the first questions that people ask is, oh, let's see the money. We could make some money out of these charge points. Um, if you're buying electricity for 15, 16, 17 pence, and you're selling them for 30 pence, and your charge point costs between five and 10 or 15,000 pounds, you are going to need to charge an awful lot of cars before you make a penny. And you're gonna to need to administrate that. And you are going to need to look after all of the software and the apps to do that too. So it's not a money-making venture. And even the big, the big companies like BP and Chargemaster, uh, Instavolt, they're not gonna be making any money for 10 or 15, 20 years. So it's the long game. But it's brilliant that we've got an organization in, in the north of England, Charge My Street, that have managed to draw down some funding from the government and are working with community buildings and communities and village halls uh, to install electric vehicle charge points. Um, next slide, please. So what's the critical thing for Charge My Street when they are looking for a host? Firstly, there needs to be a couple of car parking spots that you're happy to make available. And that might be just overnight time, or it could be during the daytime, or it could be throughout the day, or just at weekends. All of these things can be controlled by the apps. Um, you need to have a mobile signal or open broadband because people charge via their phones. Um, it needs to be in regular use by the public customers, staff or owner. Really, Charge My Street are a community benefit society. We have some village halls in the middle of nowhere in Cumbria where people, very few people visit. And we have some village halls right in the middle of Grasmere and Ambleside where lots of people are visiting. And really, the, like, like yourselves, you have to run a business. And so it means that um, as long as you've got a good footfall, Charge My Street may consider um, partnering with you. Um, and obviously it needs to be with your consent and, uh, a, a, and your support. Next slide, please. Um, so what happens uh, and how much does it cost? So Charge My Street, generally, if there's enough electricity, will install two fast chargers. Those are the ones at 22 kilowatts. Um, unless you, you don't have the correct um, uh, electricity supply and the cost of upgrading that is too much. So the cost would be neutral to the host, um, but there might be, a, might be a contribution if the upgrade is required. So I mentioned that Charge My Street would use your energy. It would then pay you back every quarter. Um, so it's zero profit but it's zero loss. And I think what's really, really key here is that if you, if you partner with a, 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 an organization like Charge My Street, or you get in an electric vehicle charge point, you are providing another service for your community and you are enabling those that are distanced from the transition because they don't have a driveway or they can't afford um, these things to actually have access to that infrastructure. The charge point is maintained by Charge My Street, who have a team uh, of software engineers and on site engineers. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned that uh, Charge My Street have grant funding, and I know that they're working with the Hope Valley, uh, the Anglers, uh, Hope Valley Anglers. Uh, action 
action group on climate um, uh, to uh, to install some charge points in the Hope Valley already. Um, one of the other ways that, or one of the contributing ways that Charge My Street are um, making this possible is some of it's through funding, direct funding through Innovate UK. But what they've done is they've set up a system of share offers where they hope to pay back the, um, those investing at 3%. And in a number of circumstances now, communities have decided that they really, really want an electric vehicle charge point. They want to draw down some of the funding from Charge My Street, um, and they want to match some of the rest of it. And that accelerates the process of installation so that where Charge My Street see a village hall and a community really eager and willing um, to put, um, to, to potentially buy some shares in Charge My Street and in the, um, and in the electric vehicle charge point, then Charge My Street may be able thereafter to come in and, uh, and install rapidly a charge point. You'll be able to find definitively on the Charge My Street um, website um, where, they, where their funding is being targeted. And you can get in touch with them and they will, they will speak to you about um, your particular village hall. So um, next slide, please. Um, so I, I, I want to leave time for questions. Suffice to say that CAFs also follow the same pathway as some great organization. We've heard from, we've heard from the Midlands Energy Hub, we've heard from March's uh, Energy Agency, we heard about the Center for Sustainable Energy, and Helena tried to remember what CAFs stand for. I know there's so many names of sustainability and environment and low carbon these days. And I know it's hard for village halls and committees to try and work out who to go to. Um, suffice to say that if you go to our website at www.cafs.org.uk, you will find some resources on energy auditing. But we also run webinars on solar PV and renewables. We do retrofit uh, traditional buildings and we run training courses and site visits on that. Um, we've had, obviously, we got flooded in 2009, in 2005, in 2015. And so have you been badly affected by uh, not just flooding, but wind and rain as well. So we do some, some, some audits and, and support for village halls with, with regard to resilience against the impacts of climate change. Um, and I think Peter mentioned there about looking at the biodiversity. We've heard again and again, this is not just about the climate crisis. It's about the biodiversity, the nature crisis. So I do implore you, if you do have any soft standing and not just car park outside your premises, try and get in touch with your local wildlife trust or or someone to, 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 to play that part in, in helping nature. Um, next slide, please. And um, I'm just gonna finish there, Helena, um, because I'd like to take any questions. Thank you, Phil. I don't think there's anything come up yet. I'm sure people will have probably been so inspired with all these ideas um, that they're probably just getting their head around it and trying to think what to ask. Um, so thank you for mentioning the, your experience with the um, car, car charging schemes. Um, it, I think it's, it's something that's been debated a lot recently at ACO as well amongst the whole network. And it, it seems to be um, something that everybody in each county is suddenly more interested in. Um, so there's been quite a lot of discussion going on there. Um, so it was a little bit about um, charities have to be careful um, about what they can provide and they have to think of the best interests of the charity first. So I think there was a little bit of, um, you know, OK, it's a great idea and they have to then think how they can fit it in with their charitable objects. Um, is it going to affect other hall users? Um, and, and use of charity money, things like that. 
So that's one of the issues. Yeah, and I think I think if I can just come in at that point, it's um, absolutely a village hall can install their own electric vehicle charge point. That 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 you know you don't have to go with anybody else if you can apply for some grant money. You can put it in, you know, next week. Um, but you do need to consider that if it's being used all the time and you're not administering it and you're not going out and asking the driver how much energy they've used or you haven't developed your own app, then you're going to find yourself quite uh, out of pocket by the end. So whilst you can do it independently, I would say that if you can go through, I think a, a really good trusted organization like Charge My Street, which is a not-for-profit, um, uh, then you've got that backup of, um, you've got the backup of software, you've got the backup of administration, they pay you straight back each uh, quarter for your electricity bills. Um, and you can get that hosted and you can potentially get a, a faster charger or two faster chargers uh, installed. So um, I, don't, I don't wanna rule anyone in or out, but just as Helena said, there are swings and roundabouts with all of this. Mm. I think it's also new to everybody as well. I think we're still, it's almost like we need a definitive like information sheet that gives all the options of what, what and the disadvantages and the advantages of either going with one method or going alone and what the disadvantages and the it, opportunities it, they are with it might be It might be worth Elena if you've got, you know, if you've got a, a village hall down there that's either installed it, installed a charge point it's, itself or, or, or is hosting one, it'd be wonderful if they, if they could invite <laughs> maybe Absolutely. a little a bit yeah. of a forum because it's so hard for, for committees to stay on top of carbon audits, energy audits, insurance, and all of the wonderful things that carbon uh, that rural action Derbyshire support. Yeah. Um, we've got a question here from um, from Repton. How do you manage day night EV slot bookings? Our car park gets used a lot by others by the day and we can't fit a barrier. So it's it's very much, you know, in the daytime, the car park's there for the hall users and maybe into the evening. It's how you would manage what who's using it in the night, during the night. Um, yeah. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple of things here is that um, uh, there, there's the use of the car park. Um, sorry, there's the use of an electric vehicle charge point parking space um, by a combustion engine. And that's, you know, so the, you've got two electric vehicle points and they're both being used for parking by a conventional combustion vehicle. That's, you might hear the term iced, so internal combustion engine. So um, that's one issue. And the other issue is whether you just want those people who are using your village hall to, to have access to that charge point rather than necessarily tourists. Um, and you might want only access at a certain time of day to those. So there are two, two possibilities here. One is, one is barriers. Barriers are expensive, but you can use the um, clock down and clock up uh, posts. Um, but the other thing is actually using the apps that um, Charge My Street um, support you with. So they can actually, um, they can monitor who's used it. They can monitor the, the, the number plates. They can turn off the, um, uh, they can turn off the charge point during the daytime or during the nighttime. So there's a lot of remote access which can support other physical barriers if that's what is required. And I do appreciate living in Cumbria that we do get some village halls where, you know, people come to do their, you know, their, their, their village hall session and it's just staved out with, with tourists. And it's, it's really, it's problematic. Mm. Yeah. Well, again, we're in a hard tourist area, as you've mentioned. I, I know. In Derbyshire as well. It's the same issues, Phil, that you'd have in yeah, Cumbria. I, I did. I used. I used to. I used to live and work in Castleton in in the, oh. in the peak. So uh, I'm I'm fairly familiar with tourists. Yeah. 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 Um, 
recently um, I heard an inspirational talk by somebody from the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles, and he was talking about uh, the new workplace charging scheme that's coming on board um, February, March next year. Um, and that will be available to charities to apply for some funding. Um, so what he was saying that village halls, sports centres, community, community pubs, community shops, anything like that, where you've got a facility and space, car parking space, and it's not impinging on your customers using your um, facilities, uh, the grants available there will be uh, £350 uh, for a single point and up to £700 for, for a double, double charging point. So yeah. that's something that obviously we will keep people informed of what funding opportunities are coming on board moving forward, because presumably there will be more and more funding made available, government funding, local authority funding will be made available for all sorts of green uh, mm -hmm. green projects. But uh, uh, the charge, electric charging points like um, Barry Lewis mentioned right at the beginning how many, I think Derbyshire County Council have already installed something like 218 in Derbyshire to date, and they're planning another 2000 or something by a certain date. So it's very much on the, um, you know, government and uh, County Council agenda as well. <clears throat> Sorry, Phil. I was just, I was just going to say that it's a, it's a real challenge for village halls and everything that they do is the the issue of budgeting in a business sense for the maintenance and repair of whatever it is that you get installed, whether that's a heat pump, solar PV, whether it's electric vehicle charge points, um, absolutely consider the upfront grants for all of these, but please, if you can, in your business planning, consider an annual maintenance of these things, what that will cost, because I certainly in my personal life rush into things and then I realised that every year I'm going to be paying £90 to have something serviced, <laughs> whether that's be my mobile phone or something else. So just, just consider it um, when, you're going, when you're going independently with a grant for something. Mm. Yeah, it goes in, uh, into it eyes wide open, basically. Um, and as you met, you touched on insurance as well. So obviously, small village halls, any any facility would have to make sure that their insurance companies are fully informed of what you're planning and what's going on. But I don't think they generally find it an issue. There wouldn't be a barrier and your insurance wouldn't suddenly shoot up that it wouldn't be cost effective. But again, you just have to notify them of what your plans are and what you intend to do on, on the premises itself. So... Um, it's an exciting time. It's, uh, I mean, a bit like the car sharing schemes that seemed to be discussed, you know, 10 years ago, and it seemed to have gone quiet again. But I think that's the thing that needs to be re regenerated, the idea of the car sharing uh, for communities. So there are all sorts of ways that, the you know, whole communities can cut back on their CO2 emissions. Absolutely. And again, we, we, we're talking about we're talking about the fair transition, aren't we, Helena? We're talking about allowing people who can't afford to buy an electric car to have that use of an electric car because actually it is so much cheaper to travel around. I live in a village here in Cumbria. There are 100 houses. There are 200 cars in our village. And on any one day, there must be 150 of them parked, paying insurance, paying mm. tax. <clears throat> and, and we just... If we could only work together, <laughs> we we could save money and save save carbon emissions and mm. be a lot happier for it. It does. It starts local. It starts at the community level. So it's very much everybody, you know, joining us today. Hopefully they're inspired with some ideas and obviously, you know, they can access lots, lots more information and come to us and charge my street and other experts on the field. We're not experts on the field. We're just here to, you know, ad advise where they can get the support and signpost people. Uh, but it is, it's just an exciting time, really. Um, and again, RAD itself, we're um, in the early stages of uh, talking to um, CAFs about uh, developing a project in Derbyshire. Uh, it's an opportunity to raise awareness and understanding amongst communities and village halls um, about what their needs are for, you know, 
uh, energy audits or maybe vehicle charging advice or any of these things that they feel we, we just want to find out what support they need, what, what's going to be useful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, whoever, whoever you choose, however this develops, what um, one of the things that we're developing in, in Cumbria is collective purchasing schemes, which you might be familiar with for in the old days of oil and <laughs> gas yeah. and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Yeah. Is that actually when it, it it pertains to everything? So when a whole group of village halls all require a an energy audit, or they all are considering, or some of them are considering a charge point, and some of them are considering solar PV or battery, is actually being able to 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 manage that means that the cost can be reduced for everybody. The learning can be shared some of the challenge and strain and time can be taken out of village hall committees. Um, and I think, you know, anyone, you know, like yourselves at Rural Action Derbyshire who can coordinate that, understand what the demand is out there and then put in a program that's, that's bespoke. It means that, you, you know, it, it becomes much more, I think, attainable for everybody. Yeah. You're right there. It's that it's almost like a hand holding and it's sharing of good practice. So I think it's a project that will lead to something very, very uh, tangible, you know, something that we can make a real difference um, to the village halls, community halls in the county. Any more questions? I don't seem to see any. Yeah, there were a couple. There was one from Pete Burgess Allen about um, how does the energy auditors group function? Is it a set free, a set fee, or do experts charge? Um, I established a set fee. To be honest, I, I used my negotiating skills, <laughs> and and I appealed to their corporate social responsibility, even though some of them were just sole traders, but. Um, uh, we, we agreed a, we agreed a fee because again coming I mean it, it's perfect for what uh, Helena was talking about there is that actually we could give them 10 or 15 village halls to audit and for that it meant that they weren't coming in at a thousand fifteen hundred pounds each they were coming in at 500 or 600 each um, and and it just made it made it, I mean, I noticed a question earlier today when someone said, have we been quoted between 250 pounds and 4,000 pounds for an energy audit? I'm not surprised. Um, it, it, it's a piece of string out there. And again, I think if, if, if a village hall can pick something off a shelf, um, and I know there are some village halls that are very technical and complicated and some that are a single room and a bathroom and a kitchen, that are a lot easier. But um, Peter, we, we, we stamped a fee on it. And if there was extenuating circumstances in as much as a very complicated community center, then we, you know, we tried to intervene to, to subsidize that, to keep it around the, you know, five, six, 700 pound mark. Right, yeah, that's fine. Uh, we are actually coming to the end of our time. So, unless anybody else... There, well, there was one more else? question. I don't know okay. if it's... Um, uh, you can do it quickly, but it's, do you have any experience of retrofitting fire or security systems to an old village hall? Ours is 100 this year. No. <laughs> there we go. That was a quick one. That might be, if it's fire, I mean, may just talk to your local um, fire brigade um, division, and they're very welcome to give advice or coming out to village halls. If there's anything to do with fire related systems, they'd be only happy, too happy to come out and talk about that. So, right, okay. So as we've said, we will make sure that uh, all the delegates do get copies of all the slides. So um, thank you, Phil, that's really very informative. As I said, we've only just touched on all of the topics because in a morning we can't possibly cover everything to do with energy and, uh, and community buildings, um, greening community buildings. We hope it's given you a good flavor uh, and inspired you to perhaps go back to your committees and 
you know, talk about or start thinking about, thinking about those basic things that Peter mentioned in his hierarchy, the things that are actually not going to be expensive or any cost at all. Think about, you know, working from the, low, the, the, the bottom up and uh, when you've achieved one level, then start looking at the next level. And then when you've done that, or if you do think your boiler is needing um, renewing or looking ahead in a few years time, start budgeting and thinking about, OK, um, you know, when you've had your energy audits and looking at what renewables would work within your particular building, start thinking about the funding and budgeting for that as soon as possible, because it's probably several years maybe before you can achieve what you're looking for. But if you don't start, you know, now or think about it in the near future, it would be it would seem more of a daunting task. Um, so I hope that you found uh, that sort of a really interesting session this morning. So I would like to thank obviously very much to all our speakers, to Barry Lewis, Michael, Peter and Phil. You've all been um, extremely informative and interesting to, to hear about your experience and your knowledge. So thank you very much for your support this morning. Um, before we finish and close, I just literally very briefly want to mention the fact that ACRE, um, and you will have seen in our newsletters, um, uh, have got a two year safeguarding in Village Halls project and we're well into the second year, so it's, it's not long to run now. So we're just highlighting the fact that we don't want Halls to forget about safeguarding issues. Uh, you can always come to RAD for um, any information on that and do look on our website, which is at the bottom of this slide. It is everybody's responsibility. I'm sure you do know that. There is an information sheet. I believe it's number four. I'm not quite sure. Um, so there's lots of information that we can provide to you. Look on the website. Um, the aim of the project is to increase the awareness and the importance of safeguarding and making sure that those important, these important rural assets, meaning you, the village halls, are welcoming and safe places to visit uh, for all. Next slide, Sky, please. Um, it's actually, um, it's National Safeguarding Adults Week this week. 15th to the 21st of November. So that was quite good timing to remind you about it. Um, and if you do want to look on their website, I've, I've included it at the bottom. There are lots of resources. Um, there's podcasts going on. There are posters you can download uh, that you might want to put up or remind your user groups as well uh, of all the information and the resources that are available there. So look on our website uh, or go straight to the anchor and craft trust uh, website. So this is just a little bit of a reminder. Um, I don't think there's another slide. Let's just check, is there another one? Yes, just to remind you that the Acre Doomsday book is still open. Um, a lot of you, I think, have already signed it. It's an exciting initiative to celebrate um, 100 years um, Ad, uh, village Hall's advice of Village Halls, uh, which was launched earlier in 2021 during Village Halls Week. Uh, but if you think it's too late, it isn't. It's still open and you can go onto the ACRE website and please do sign it if you haven't. Um, so finally, before we go, just to say again, thank you to our sponsors, ESP uh, and insurance, otherwise we would not have been able to um, provide the um, event free of charge. So we are really, really thankful and grateful for them. Uh, tomorrow, if you're joining us tomorrow, uh, the second day, the topic is community hubs, uh, more than just a meeting place. Um, we have an opening address again uh, by the Police and Crime Commissioner, Angelique Foster followed by uh, talks on community hubs and warm hubs by Bev Parker from Rural Action Derbyshire and Christine Nichols for Community Action Northumberland. Uh, and then after coffee, we've got a case study, which some of you may be aware of, that there's a new Ashbourne Sports Pavilion uh, on the wreck in Ashbourne. Um, so we've got Norman Harris and their architect, architect James Dacra, joining us um, to talk about the challenges of a new build during the pandemic. 
So thank you for joining us and we hope to see you tomorrow. Um, and thank you again. Can I just add, Helena, as well, I've just got up on the screen at the moment um, a conference survey uh, for today. Um, I've also put the link into the chat. If you could all just before you leave, um, follow the link either in the chat or scan it on the screen to leave the feedback, that would be absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sky. If you can give us some feedback, that would be really helpful and it'll help us to, um, you know, at our future events. So um that would be great so i'm going to sign off okay right